Welcome, everybody, live to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. Hope everybody's doing well. We welcome all of our viewers, lovely viewers watching all around the United States and Canada, all throughout North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and all points up down east west north south we got you covered so great to have you here so great to have our very special guest joining us from los angeles california you recognize that face don't you yes teo pengelis is here of course noted for so many incredible hours and years and decades on television we're talking about over 40 years in various ways shapes and forms including days of our lives general hospital also mission impossible and we're going to be talking about also, in addition to his iconic career on television as a phenomenal daytime television favorite, we're also going to be talking about a lot of other things that he's doing. He's working on. He's quite the adventurer. He's been a historian pretty much all his life. He loves to travel. He loves to cook. He loves to celebrate life and art, history and people. And that might be a whole other side of his life because you know him on television and on film and stage and all. But that might be a whole other side of his life that you were not aware of. And you're going to discover it here on the Gym Master Show Live. So we're so, we're so excited about that. And uh, if you'd like to comment during the show, you can while the show is on live. Uh, feel free to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. And that is right now you can comment in the lovely hall chat room which is something very special uh, it's for the international viewers the regional viewers the local viewers everybody watching around the world who would like to chat say hello to one another you can do that right now say hello to us don't forget to uh you know, let us know how much you're enjoying the series and all these great episodes uh, almost a thousand we've done in a short period of time first let's talk about our very special guest who's joining us again from los angeles you know him again from Days of Our Lives and General Hospital, as well as Santa Barbara. And, of course, the eight, 88 and 90 fabulous series, Mission Impossible. It was a reboot, of course, Peter Graves and company in that as well. We're going to talk about some of those incredible things that may spark up memories for you as well. But did you also remember that he was in the miniseries, the television miniseries, Sadat. And he was also in Sidney Sheldon's Memories of Midnight. Yes. And of course, Omar Sharif as well in that. Also in the movie with Kelly LeBrock, Hidden Treasures. Yes. And also, he is a wonderful and prolific author. And he has penned these books. And we're going to talk more about this and so much more. Of course, Places, the journey of my days, my lives. This is an epic, epic thing that you should have in your reading library. And if you love food, gang, he is a foodie. We have foodies that love our series. How about seducing celebrities one meal at a time? This is another fabulous book that he has penned. And he's worked with some of the greats, including Elizabeth Taylor playing his sister-in-law, Sister Laura Cassidyne on, of course, General Hospital. He's got this incredible podcast. He's very excited about sharing the lost treasures. We're going to be talking about that because he has been a world traveler uh, all his life. While he was doing and still, you know, working on television and film, he's traveled the world and he's always enjoyed doing that. And he loves documenting it and he loves celebrating it and bringing the history to life, the lost treasures. You know, we move so fast in our lives these days, we don't always have an opportunity to appreciate the past, our history, our ancestors, those beautiful cultures and lands. Well, he has done that uh, throughout his life, and it's really fantastic. Of course, he uh, got the wonderful break in 81, playing Victor Cassidyne on General Hospital, which many of you remember. And then this opportunity came to play uh, Count Tony DeMera on Days of Our Lives, which really became something quite special and really pivotal in his life because he's been doing this for so long. And uh, who doesn't love Days of Our Lives? Again, they're celebrating, they're celebrating like 60 years. This is a photo of when it was 56 years with the uh, cast and crew and just really unbelievable. He's had an extraordinary career. He's even had an opportunity to work with 
Dame Edna, yes. And we're going to talk about that and so much more. You may remember that, but uh, it really is truly my pleasure and honor to welcome him to the show. And again, if you want to comment on the show, gang, feel free. You're very, very welcome to do that. We really appreciate all these comments that are piling in here already. And uh, let me tell you just a little bit more because it is really one of the greatest runs in television during his more than four decade run on Days of Our Lives. Teo has kept the plots twisting and passions burning by playing two lookalike villains. <laughs> and of course, we know Count Tony Tamara, but also Andre as well. And it's just something that uh, viewers have loved his character, or I should say characters for years. He truly is one of television's favorite daytime villains. He grew up in Sydney, Australia, and, um, you know, made his mark there, but then decided he wanted to go to Hollywood, to California, to America, to take his chances, and he did, and aren't we glad that he did. The Australian-born star, more, much more than a guy who knows how to deliver a nasty line and take a woman's slap. <laughs> He's a world traveler, celebrated host of Hollywood dinner parties, as I mentioned. He's authored wonderful books, and now this child of Greek immigrants is pouring his passions for all things Greece into his podcast, the Lost Treasures, a thrilling detective story style exploration of Greece's greatest contributions to the world of literature and more. We're going to talk about all that. First, let's welcome him with his cup of coffee in tow. The incomparable Teo is joining us here from Los Angeles. Teo, welcome to the Gym Masters show, my friend. It's a pleasure to have you here. And cheers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, what was missing in all of that was a couple of violins, I think. It was, uh, you know, you, you get old enough, you realize you've done a few things in your life. You've you know? done a few things in your life and continue to. And I think one of the things that stands out with uh, the fans from all around the world who love you, Teo, is not only your your brilliance and your your artistry, but it's also the elegance that you you have there's a certain style of finesse a suave nature that is an automatic that may be enhanced when you're on the soap operas but it's an automatic and this rich cultural history that you have and this appreciation for people and life and food art and history i think it just really it's a renaissance situation for you i think it's a very special thing you know um you know, you know, whatever I did in Australia, which is um, not that much, really. I was a, an immigration official uh, in my youth. And yes. um, I remember um, my job was to um, bring in the immigrants from uh, south, southern Greece uh, and Italy and, um, and the Brits. Um, that, that kind of diplomacy, you know, you don't realize what it is that plants the seed of how you become. And so when I planted the seed of diplomacy, uh, it's funny how later on how it becomes an asset. And as an actor, that kind of diplomacy added to what I was doing as Tony Demera and and Andre Demera, I suppose. But even, for, even with Mission Impossible, uh, some people got it, some people didn't. But I must say, I was one of those fortunate people who, in their 20s, crossed paths with some of the greats. Yes. And, uh, and when I spent time with them, I didn't have much to say. I had very little experience. But, you know, I studied all these subjects that came to me without even searching for them. I needed a job, so I studied the art. I got $75 a week on that job as an apprentice. Um, I went into the fashion world. Um, you know, I met some really big, big shots, including John Gilgood and Robert Redford, um, heads of studios. Yes. Uh, and I learned from the way they presented themselves. You know, you don't realize what you're taking in as you're growing because your your 20s really is where the great growth comes. Mm -hmm. the beginnings of what you're, what you're planting so that in your 30s, you start to realize there's a foundation that you stand on. And so little did I know all of this was being prepared for what I was doing and why Tony Demera and Andre Demera um, have 
have been successful characters all these years. And so it's, it's all that training and all the, the appreciation of those who came before me and how well and what they contributed to life. I mean, when I look at Stephen Sondheim and, who, and the music he contributed to, to the American uh, 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 theater, uh, you know, it was extraordinary. So when I met him, when I met um, Harold Prince, when I, I met Lillian Gish, when I met, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Robert Redford, and then I, yeah, and then having tea with uh, at twenty one um, with uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, all those things in the twenties was you know you take it for granted. You say, oh, it's just life. It's not until later when you're maturing, yes, you realize that somehow some angel or angels have been directing you so that I always had behind my mind not to embarrass the family in Australia because we Greeks, you know, have to preserve the name. And so, sorry about that. Is that the family calling in to confirm all that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, anyway. Very so, close family. <laughs> very, very close family. Uh, it, it was um, when I sat with Jacqueline Kennedy and I realized the way she presented herself, even though it was a woman, I mean, we all have male and female qualities. Our sensitivity is our female side, you know? And she was just, I mean, she was more interested in the history of where I came from and my mm -hmm. history of Greece and Australia. Yeah. Um, and spending an hour with her, you know, because at 21, what do you know? Not very much. Right. And uh, so, but she was quite interested, and I spent that whole time with her. So, you know, that's become one of the most iconic experiences I ever had. But yes. it wasn't until I met um, Milton Katselis, who was one of the great teachers um, and also a Broadway director, um, who actually got fired by Elizabeth Taylor in Private Lives. So I think there's a kind of connection there as well. But yes. And this was, was around that time. There you are then. Yes. Yes. I was 29 there. Um, anyway, so, uh, you know, all, all those things that come in. And I remember when I wrote Places, I thought, you know, the family, I didn't ask enough questions to the to the families because um, I had 45 first cousins. And so you had all these aunts and uncles. Now they're all gone. But none of us really uh, sat with them, nor were they interested in, in telling us the stories. What What happened? How did they get to Australia? What was it like living in their environment? And so when I wrote Places, I started to ask questions. Some are already gone. But that's what the, I said, I want to have a book yeah. that if a family member 100 years from now say, oh, what was the family's like? I, I, would, I would have that as a reference. And so that's why I wrote it. And that's why the podcast as well, it's like curiosity keeps us going. And, um, and uh, you know, with the situation being the way it is, how do you understand other cultures? That's why I don't understand why we're in this turmoil here. Yeah. You know, why we don't accept other cultures. They've got things to tell us. Yes, There's right. information, knowledge that a lot of us have never heard. Or How about food? The influence of cuisine. You know, so when you go to their country and you see the way they live, you come back more educated yes and more excited because those things lift you absolutely you know, it's not about just sitting on the beach and and, no. and reading a book it's about going in there and living the way they live and then you yeah. come back and then you influence others so well it's really amazing because i often say that uh you know we work with in these industries producers, executive producers, sometimes we are executive producers. I've always said that my executive producer is my mom and dad, as were yours. Tell us about your folks. <laughs> it's a beautiful, heartwarming shot of you too with them. You know, my mother had cancer there and it was, um, you know, they used to say, oh, you can't go home. And I made sure that when I did go home, I had something to stand on. Yeah. Um, my, my father, you know, they both came from fine families in an island called Castellores or in Greece. Uh, and so when they came to Australia, my father had, there was no other jobs offered except labor work. Mm. And so 
you know, he dug up streets, and I, I think it really, uh, it didn't inspire him. And when I saw that, I thought he wasn't a mentor for me. My mother was a very gracious woman who was highly sensitive and understood that I was different to the rest of the family and uh, because I was her first son. And as they say, you know, the, the, the son's first great love is his mother and the great last love of the mother is her son. And so uh, I, I swore to myself that I was going to do something important in my life and then I would send for them. And I did. And so I, I helped them travel to Europe many times and to America. And so that was the, it was a great win. And I always thought, why did I want to, I was so interested in archaeology, why would I want to go into archaeology? Because, you know, it, it's really the journeys of, of the unknown. And when I, when I would take a journey, uh, I would prepare beforehand so I would not be ignorant. Because when I went to Syria, um, they asked me when I arrived in Damascus, uh, what was I doing in their country? And I said, oh, I came to explore your history. And they said, what history? I said, the one before you. And he threw the passport in my face and spat on the side, persona non grata. And I thought, oh, this was a lovely welcome. But I knew enough in my travels, not even though I would instigate sometimes, just to stir people up. Um, it was just a wonderful... I mean, even though it was troubling, when I got in and I thought, oh, I'm in, it's like all these treasures, you know, they're, not, they're, they're being destroyed now by ISIS. And, but I got to see, I got to go to the castles, I got to understand uh, about the, the, uh, the, uh, the, in the 12th and 13th century about how the Crusaders fought in that country, you know, who, who was the great leader next to Muhammad, which was Salah Adin, you know, which was the great leader. So you learn all about that. And then I started to go to cafes, and there are these men who would be playing the guitar with a room full of, of males, no women, and they'd be smoking and having their coffee, and they would tell stories of their ancient heroes. And so, you know, I, I, I sat there and I thought, my God, this has been going on since the illiterate age from the 8th to the 12th century BC, and it's still continuing. And so, in a way, by telling these stories, we are, the, our people who do podcasts are really the, the, the modern version of the ancient bard. It's incredible. And, and that's why, you know, I decided to do these stories. But you've been traveling in an adventure throughout your life, right? This has been something that has always been near and dear to your heart, discovering incredible places. There you are in St. Sophia Church. I mean, it's something that is just in your blood to want to do this, right? Well, it's, I'm always curious. I, I you know, that's Troy. Yes. I mean, imagine sitting in Troy uh, at the edge and there are nine cities built over each other. And I sat at the edge and what they call the Trode. When you look out, this is where the war between the Greeks and the Trojans had taken place. Uh, I mean, you know, you have to have an imagination or allow your imagination to expand rather than just, you know, reading somebody else's version. You find your own version and that's what you end up understanding. And, and that's what I ended up writing. And uh, that, that's outside the museum. I mean, yeah, you still. know. The, yeah, it's and so I'm going back there uh, next month. And so, oh, are you really? Yeah, I'm going to go and explore Heriopolis, um, which is an ancient Roman city, which is near Ephesus, and uh, it was also a great Christian place. I'm very interested in Christianity, and mm -hmm. uh, that's why I visited many uh, mosques. And and uh, I, I just there's something about being still. In, in like in, in, in the cathedral and the smoke of the candles and you're sitting there, it's like somehow you're part, you become part of that history and your mind suddenly say, oh, Napoleon walked down there when he yes. christened himself king, you know. Incredible. Uh, I mean, it's just, there's just so much. Listen, I became an actor because I wanted to support my journeys. I didn't become, it wasn't the other way around. I didn't become an actor to get famous or to have, I knew it was, went to many places I could 
get a job that would give me maybe a lot of money because traveling is expensive. So I, I would save my money. And, 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 and what I didn't realize is when you travel, when you come back to your job, you're richer. Yes. Because you have expanded all your senses. Yes. So you come back to the job. So, you know, so that Andre or Tony wouldn't be boring because you have to go beyond the page and your writers are, uh, are looking at you to see, oh, what's he giving us that we haven't thought of yet? You know, it's all those aspects that feed the character. And then in the end, the result, it either works or it doesn't. But I took those journeys and, and I also bought my own clothes. I mean, in those days, they gave me quite a bit of money to go to Rome and buy my own wardrobe. Mm. And so that was another fantasy, you know, walking down Villa Condotti in, in Rome and going into Armani store and pointing your finger, this, this, this and that I want, <laughs> and then come home with it. The actors didn't know that that's what I was doing, but I dressed my own character because I thought I had that training in the early days in fashion. And so when you dress your own character, it brings your character into a kind of completeness. It also changes the walk. Mm -hmm. So if you look, when you talked about sophistication and all that, well, it's knowing how to wear a suit. Yes. You know, it's knowing how to stand. But, you know, in the long run, you've got, it, you become simple. Yes. And knowing that, how to speak and articulate and inflect, because everybody talks so fast and we're using all kinds of uh, shortened versions of words and everything is uh, initials and abbreviations as opposed to elongating and, and speaking. And as conversationalists, as on-air people, as you know, wordsmiths, sometimes it's a little crazy because you actually want to say the full word and everybody's, everything's so short and quick now. Yes, uh, abbreviated. Yes. Uh, you know, everything kind of succinct. You, uh, how do you become a storyteller? And that's not easy. You realize sometimes when you're sitting around what I call the watering hole, which is your dining table, where everybody sits around discussing things, and the more interesting the conversation, the longer the dinner party is. But that's how they did it in the old days. You know, they would arrive on time. You would have an atmosphere created with, you know, your flowers, the smell of the food, uh, just the whole presentation. And then when they'd come in, they feel like they've come into a very positive space and they want to stay. And that's very important. Yes. How to become, because it takes a lot to host a party. Yes. Because while everything's cooking, you've got to say hello to everybody. And they're saying, oh, can I have another drink in the middle of the time when you're you're doing the last course and, and, right. and it's like you've got no time and and I, and and people come in the kitchen because you know that's another watering hole they love to come in and talk to you while you're stirring it's always the kitchen yeah you know, they love to come in and chat and then you want to say please leave the kitchen because i'm yeah. my mother says that every time during the holidays how come everybody congregates in the kitchen <laughs> i'm trying to get the turkey out of the oven <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes and look what it takes to put all that together I mean, that's that's an art form, yes. that Thanksgiving meal. I yeah. mean, you know, that's why mothers do it so well, because it's part of the tradition. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so, uh, but anyway, um, you know, these the, the, uh, the, the exploration I've been doing on, on these podcasts really had to do with the fact of something that I've always wanted to do was to dig in the earth somewhere and find a treasure. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I started to read about treasures and mm. what they found. And, and Schliemann, Ulrich Schliemann, who was born in, in, uh, in Germany, um, he, he said something which I always remember. At eight years of age, he said to his father, after his father gave him the gift of, of, um, of the Iliad, and when he looked at photographs that were in there, he said, Father, if we look at these walls, they're not, they're not destroyed. There must be some treasure there. There must be gold. Well, they all laughed at him. He said, I'm going to find it one day. And they laughed. He had nine brothers and sisters. But that age, eight years of age, in 1873, at the age of 67, he found the treasures of Troy. And even though he thought at the time it belonged to the Trojan War, those treasures really 
were from an earlier Bronze Age, which was 2500 BC. But the gold and the, the workmanship was extraordinary. And of course, in his romantic way of looking at things, he thought, I'm going to marry a Greek girl who's going to be my Helen of Troy. So, of course, when he found the jewelry, he said, this belonged to Helen of Troy. So, you know, he, he exaggerated in that. But this treasure, you know, was offered to Greece, but they wouldn't give him a wing. And so he took the treasure and, took, and gave it to Germany. And then, of course, in 1945, at the end of the war, when the Russians came in and stole over five million pieces yeah. of art, it ended up in the Pushkin Museum. It was lost forever, they thought, through the mm. bomb by the Allies. And, and, and you know, that got me, I, I was really intrigued by that. And so I followed in his footsteps. And um, the next great treasure that he found was in, in because it was part of the Trojan War, it was where Agamemnon in, in a place called Mycenae. And Mycenae was part of the late Bronze Age, which was around 1200 BC. And that's the time when he started thinking about digging in Greece. And when he did, he went into uh, the, the entrance is, is, is the lion's gate. And when he went through, he, he saw this citadel and the stones were so enormous, he had no idea. It was like the Egyptians. Who built these? How did they carry these humongous stones and put them on top of each other with no mortar between them? This is how perfect they were in their discoveries. Anyway, uh, what he found, and this is what I always say, the thing that got me about this story was while he was digging and he, he and, and very quietly for about six weeks, he started, he came across his first discovery in Mycenae. And when he looked down and was doing it gently. He came across a golden mask, and then he came across a shield, and then a sword. And then when he lifted the golden mask, at that moment, he saw someone who was from 1200 BC, he thought, was actually 1500 BC. But when he took the mask off, can you imagine? He was the first to witness that. And within seconds, the whole thing disintegrated into dust. It's extraordinary. Wow. Well, you so know, that's one thing that certainly has not happened to your career in a very <laughs> difficult, you like that segue? In a very <laughs> difficult, demanding uh, career yeah. and field of entertainment. When you, you know, born and raised in Sydney, Australia, beautiful country, Australia, uh, were you nervous? What was it that got you to say, you know, I keep hearing about this place called America and Hollywood. I think we're going to give it a shot. What was it? What was the inspiration for you to leave Australia and come to the United States and try to make it in, you know, a very difficult industry as well? Uh, what were some of those inspirations for you early on, Teo? Well, I was a movie buff. And so from the age of eight, the only way I could find and make any money was to go where all the drunks were with their beer bottles, <laughs> yeah. collapsed in the lanes of the suburbs. And so I would take a big sack and collect beer bottles. I would take it to the glass factory and get, I don't know, whatever money I could. Then that allowed me to go into a movie theater and see a movie and dream in my dark yes. uh, imagination at oh, the time. Yeah. And, and then I, I couldn't afford to get any popcorn. And I remember as a kid, you know, kids would like to get away with things. And so I remember I put my hand underneath this machine because I was small and I can put and reach up and I used to be able to grab a whole handful of popcorn and bring it out and put it in my pockets. And so that would feed me through <laughs> the movies. <laughs> um, you know, I said to my father, my father was not uh, a great father to me at the time. Uh, we, we made up in the end. Uh, I, I was glad of that. Um, but he was a, a bit abusive. And so uh, the real reason I, I came to America was because I used to see those movies where everything looked so beautiful. The, 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 the streets were so clean, the, the beautiful love stories, the people going to their church. I mean, it was all like a fantasy in a way. And I thought, look at America, no problems. <laughs> you know, we didn't have the drugs and all the rest of it that came along later, but um, it was dreamlike for me. And so I said, one day, this was when I was 17, I'm going to go to America. And someone said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to America. 
So what happened was I went to a party and there was the belly for Clerico. The whole team of actors and, and dancers were there. And I, the, uh, Amalia Hernandez, who was the, um, the choreographer, looked at me and, and I reminded her of her son. So she welcomed me to, to take a free trip with them Wow. They were going because they were on, a, on, on, on this flight and they said, we're leaving in a few weeks. Would you like to go? Now I was 20 years of age and and I went to my parents and they said, absolutely not. You're not going anywhere. And so I went to an uncle who convinced them. My mother was sobbing. My father was furious because he thought I, that, you know, his oldest son was going to leave the family all and long before their sister, his sisters got married. Uh, and I went to America and I said, I only go for three weeks. I went for a year and I stayed and I worked at the United Nations for one year. And then I, I was running out of money. I couldn't support myself. So I went back home and I went back home and I just lasted eight days. And a friend of mine said, listen, we're going to send you a ticket. So they sent me a ticket to go back. And that's when I became serious about I got to have some kind of a career. And if I didn't, that meant that my parents could point at me and my relatives as well and say, you see, you didn't listen, you failed. So yeah. I thought, so this time I didn't go back for six years. And so I started to work as an actor. I trained for eight years. And and so I got to learn my craft. And then... Um, and that was it. And then my, uh, my bus in the art world took me to Egypt. Um, and, yes. and that opened my horizons. And, and I went, wow, Egypt. And, and then I went to the pyramids at 1 o'clock in the morning. And, they, and that's part of one, the fourth story in the podcast where they tried to kidnap me at the pyramids and hmm. drag me into the desert. I, I mean, I, I've, I tell a lot of stories because it wasn't all you know, safe and wonderful. You have to know the tricks of the trade. How do you travel safely? And exactly. how do you tell someone who's trying to take advantage of you as opposed to someone who's really genuinely who is genuinely caring in, and caring and so interested, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you you first went to New York City, right? And you yeah. were yeah. you were involved in the fashion world for a bit and with yeah. uh, of course oh Ronald Melodandre. Yes. Oh my god. He screamed at me because he wanted me to open his store in because he thought I would be good with politicians I would have been, uh, mm -hmm. and go to Washington. Do you know when I told him I was going to become an actor, he said, are you effing serious? Do you see what <laughs> assholes they are? You're these actors that come in here with their bloody egos. Why would you want to get into that field? You're good at fashion. Do the fashion. But I left and he died of a heart attack three years later while he was running through Central Park. Uh, his son, yeah. who I met, was a little boy at the time, is head of animation at Fox today. So it's That's a, what a story. There yeah. is also this, um, you mentioned having met Robert Redford as well. I, I met him at an event at Carnegie Hall, which was wonderful that I was emceeing. Uh, tell us about that early meeting with um, Robert Redford and uh, just a slight suggestion about fashion and what have you. <laughs> well, you know, you notice Redford always dresses well, mm. and uh, but he was not the warmest human being, mm. and so you know he came in three times uh, to the store because Melodandria wasn't there. He he would just leave. He wouldn't even say, "I'll come back later." And one day when he came, my my boss had said to me, "When he comes in again, you better tell him you have something. <laughs> you have to find a way of keeping him." Uh, uh, here and I said, "Okay." So one day he came in. I said, "Oh, I've got something for you. Roland wants me to show you something." He goes, "What?" I said, Roland said that we have this new suit that he knows was made for you. And so he he said, okay. I said, I'll lock the door. Nobody else will come in. So uh, we had a private, about 20 minutes. He came in and it was a, a wonderful, uh, uh, fine cotton corduroy suit in brown with, with, with um, ivory buttons. And I remember, and I've told this story, but we were standing in front of the mirror. And because Australian, being an Australian, and we're very to the point, as, as Roland had high armpits, the way he cut, so the person would look leaner in the cut, and he would put the button right on the belly button so it would look straight down, so you could cover somebody's stomach by the way it was cut. So when I went up and I touched, and the thing was you stand there, 
and you put your hands to the armpit and go down. And as I was going down, I came across two. <laughs> Something a little extra. <laughs> a, little, a little extra on, on the thing, which gave it a bump. See, you're so diplomatic. You might be direct, but you do it in such a suave way. <laughs> oh. So I told him if he was going to buy the suit, and he should wear it because it looked good on him, he needed to lose that. And I grabbed those two bumps, and I think, and he looked in the mirror, shocked that anybody would say that to him. And I was shocked that it came out of my mouth. And then we started laughing. And you know what was nice? Ten years later, I'm at La Scala in Beverly Hills having dinner, and a friend of mine said, oh, let's go somewhere from Australia. Let's go somewhere where there are movie stars, you know. I said, okay, La Scala should have something. And who was there? Robert Redford and Paul Newman, Rex Harrison. And all I remember is Robert Redford on his way out came over to my table, shook my hand ten years later, and said, how are you, Teo? And I was shocked. I was shocked that he remembered. And he was, I thought, ah, you know, that's why I've always liked his work. You know, he's, he's got, he's a great guy. I mean, he, to do that. And also, you know, he's a wonderful actor and, and producer yeah. and director. So, you know, it's, it's one of those stories that, you know, you'll never forget, you know, um, when people like that cross your path. And then in the end, you know, when they do, they're not aloof, they're not rude. Exactly. They greet you in a human way. And, right. You know, so you, you know you did something right. And, uh, and you were trying to help. You were offering excellent yes, advice. Yes, very good advice on how to wear it. To a, make somebody a suit, I mean, present themselves even more stepped up. <laughs> stepped up, oh. So yeah. Roland came in, my uh, Maladandre, and he was thrilled that I sold him the suit. Uh, and that's why Roland thought I would be, well, part of it was he tested all the salesmen who were in the store. And he, and the way he tested you was he'd give you a week at the register so that by the end of the week, he could accumulate all that was the monies and how was, how much was in the till. And mine was to the penny accurately to the penny, which told, told him that I could be trusted with his money. And so therefore he gave me the upgrade and dressed me up in wonderful suits. And I had attitude, learned the attitude of having to carry them. And then, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I was sad, you know, in many ways because he didn't last long and he was a great influence. You know, the reason why, um, uh, and he's, he's very tasteful, but um, Ralph Lauren, when I went into Melodandre, I followed Ralph Lauren. That Ralph Lauren was designing ties at the time. And, and Roland said to me, I had a, one of the things I, I had an eye for was color. And in those days, you, you had to put color, a pattern upon pattern and colors upon colors. And how did they, how did you know? You either have that insight or, or you don't. It's, it's not something that you train. And, and so, I, you know, even, um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, uh, John Gilgood, uh, and he came in, and the colors I put for him, uh, in the end, um, you know, it was all part of the foundation you build upon yourself so that when you reach my age now, which is to be in your last renaissance, you stand on something, right. something of value, so right. uh, that I could be mature enough to talk to you and have enough stories to share with you. Right. And they're interesting enough. I suppose, because they've lasted. Um, you know, how do you tell a story? Uh, mm. You know, too many people, when they tell a story, there are too many bridges. Mm. And they exactly. drop the story, and, then, and they're not listening to the person listening. So. Right, exactly. Right, it's not, they're not making a connection, and they're not yeah. finding a way to sort of relate, and relatability is so important when you're telling stories, because you're, you're teaching as you're telling, and then people find the relatability, to it and and people have always gravitated to you in so many different ways one of the folks early on you mentioned this incredible array of extraordinary people new york hollywood all around that you've met one early on claudette Colbert. tell uh, us about that you know 
I remember her in my youth from the old black and white movies, mm -hmm. Ma and Pa Kettle and, and Cleopatra and um, all those war movies she did. She was quite the big star. Um, and she won the Oscar with Clark Gable, who won an Oscar for It Happened One Night, the Capra film. And she, my boss in the art world, who was ra rather a prick, uh, I hope you can say that, um, he... <laughs> <laughs> Notice he asks after. <laughs> yeah. And we're live. Now you're she fine. Did. You're fine. The words people use today, that's that's child's play now. <laughs> that word. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's, <laughs> right? it's, it's in the way you say it. You, know, you can say the word, uh, the bad word. It's, it's all about that emphasis. Accent, you know, it, it <laughs> right. could be very humorous by the way you say it, or it could be devastating to somebody else, you know. You can say it with fond like, affection. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, it's a, it's a word of affection these days. Right. Was, when Claudette Colbert came in, and I was sitting at the desk, and I was 21, and she goes, oh, Bob, why don't you ask the man to join us for, for lunch? He's so pretty. He goes, no. And I said, oh, I'd love to. And she, he said, looked at me seriously, he said, no. And she said, oh, come on, Bob. What she had come to do, she brought two paintings, a Utrio and a Monet. And she was living in Barbados and she wanted them copied. So we had a person come in who was going to copy the Monet and, and he was going to do the Utrio. And they were worth, you know, in the millions. And so she didn't want the climate to affect the paintings. She realized that's what was happening. So Bob said, no, you stay here. And that's when I said, fine. I wanted to call my mum up and say, mum, I just met Claudette Colbert. I'm going places, you know, just to give him something positive rather than saying, I'm sitting making $75 a week. Right. And I'm staring at 18th century furniture, which is not mine. Right. You know, so all I, was, I had one suit. And so um, she forgot her shoes. Mm. So I closed the shop and I went down to the restaurant and I took her to her and I said, oh, uh, Miss Colbert, you forgot your, your, oh, thank you so much. Oh, Bob, why don't you let him stay? You know, he's so pretty, she says again. And he says, would you get back to the shop? <laughs> I said, fine. So I go back to the shop, and that's when the extraordinary thing happened. Ten minutes later, there's a knock on the door, and it's Jacqueline Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And that's how I spent mm -hmm. an hour with Jacqueline Kennedy. And that's when my boss came back because he would have loved to have met Jacqueline Kennedy. I mean, what was that was like there, for you? You must have been pinching yourself. That had to be incredible. Oh, listen, do you think I I, I, I called upstairs to, to the manservant and said, would you make tea for two, please? And he laughed at my head. He says, you know, you're an apprentice. You yeah. can't ask for tea. I said, yes, there's a very special person here. Would you please make the tea? Could you just please just take, said, take my word for it? <laughs> I, made, I made some Greek cookies. So... Um, so he brought, he couldn't believe it was her, you know, and so my bus came back and said, was anybody important that came along? And I said, yes, Dr. Kennedy. And he just went crazy. He was so upset. And three weeks later, she called and she wanted to speak to me and I sold her a $40,000 piece of sculpture. Mm. So that's my, my Jackie story. You know, it's. How did it get to then where people started noticing you for the acting for the ability to really tell a story in the way you do. I know one of the first, if not the first Hollywood movie for you was this, of course, wonderful Walter Matthau and Ingrid Bergman, Goldie Hawn, Cactus Flower. Yeah, I was an extra. I was sitting in the, I was sitting in the uh, gallery and the manager of, um, of Jack Lemmon came in and, uh, mm. and one of my favorite actors, Matthau. Jack Lemmon. Oh yeah. yeah wonderful. And and he said, oh, you know, you should be in the movies. And and I said, oh, well, I can't, I can't. He said, well, why don't you come in as an extra and you can make some money. So I, while I was working during the day at night, I was shooting as an extra. I also danced with. She, I was chosen from the group of extras, and I was asked by uh, Ingrid Bergman to have a dance with her, and I danced with her, and and I thought, oh wow, this is this is magic time, you know. So that's how it kind of started slowly because um, I was an apprentice. And so I had to save my money because I needed to go to classes. And, and that's how it all began. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a full story, you know? It, it, as I say, 
in my book. It's a life well lived. And, um, yes. and you stop with one life. Who knows what happens afterwards or what happened before? But this is the time, and this is in your in your present. You want to say, am, am I am I doing my best? Am I enriching myself and those who surround me? Do I make a difference in people's lives? And does the company that surround me, do they make a difference? And as you get older, you realize some people are there to waste your time. Yes. To your light. Yeah. So I've had to clear the decks in the last couple of years. and uh, That's liberating and refreshing to do that, isn't it? Yes. The timing is not always appropriate, but, you know, Sometimes you have people who play victims all the time. Yeah. And you're, you're their rescuer. After a while, you think this is not making a difference. And you're also postponing their development. And your own growth. And my own growth. Absolutely. You, you sound, I think I'm talking to a mirror because the words you just said, I've been saying the last couple of years as well. Mm. Kindred spirits in that way. And it's not always easy to do, to, to just do the cut no, or no, these, pull the plug. But you have to. Yeah, these are our awakenings, if we're listening. And I, th I think to myself that, listen, in the right time, when you're ready, it'll happen. And so that's why now, you know, with all the stories I've known and explored and everything, why did I now do the podcast when I've been waiting for five years for certain people? Because uh, somebody dies or someone gets fired and it doesn't go further, but perseverance wins out because you say to myself, it's got to mean something. I can't, can't go through all of this and not mean something to me and to an audience. And I thought, there are people out there that can't travel. Yeah. And I think to myself, well, then let them hear your stories so they at least get inspired, you know, whether they can't afford it, maybe physically uh, they can't do it, whatever reason, their fears. I um, but you know, uh, you know, I'm rewarded because uh, someone said to me recently, "I can you 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 share your success." A lot of people just it's just I, I see actors and actors that I work with, and it's all about them. It's just about them. There's nothing to share. Nothing to share involves them, and you know, in many ways, I'm kind of disappointed because. Uh, other than Deidre Hall and Lauren Coslow and Leanne Hunley, none of those actors have even come on board or even been curious about what it is I'm doing, you know, doing these journeys. And because they're the younger ones and they don't know even what happened five years ago. But those of us who are the vets have a history. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why we have succeeded and why, why we're still succeeding. Exactly. Exactly. You know, of course, everybody knows you from so many incredible things that are daytime television involved, General Hospital being uh, the first as Victor Cassadine. How did that opportunity come your way? Well, I had just um, finished a movie called Altered States with Ken Russell. And Bill yes. Ray. And um, that was a sad I mean, they're, they're gone. You know, I look back now and I think, oh, Bill well, Hurt. Hurt, yeah. The guy the, uh, last year. Uh, Ken Russell, who was one of the meanest sons of bitches I've ever worked with. But mm. in the end, you know, when I hosted a talk show in Australia, yeah. he was one of my first guests. And I thought, because he was so, such a neurotic and, and, and drank too much, and therefore others uh, were affected by it, but mm. he, was, he was just fantastic to me. I just couldn't believe it was the same man I'd worked with. Uh, and and because of that, and, and then I, I had done a play in New York uh, called Jockeys, and I, I did a, a number of films and then came out to the Geffen Theatre to do a, a play. And then suddenly the strike came. So there was this film that I just did, which was getting a lot of attention. And, and then suddenly we weren't allowed to work. So the only thing available was the soaps. And so that that suddenly was in 1981. God, I can't believe it's been that long. In 1981, I get a call to a test for um, one of the Cassidines. And uh, if you notice, in those days, uh, a lot of uh, there weren't a lot of English accents, if there were any English-sounding accents. So they said, "No, our audience really is all very American." And so they passed on me. 
But the producer said, you know what, bring him back because the actor they chose ended up being a weak actor as a character. He was playing it weak. They needed the, they, just like the Demeros on, on, on days, the Cassidines were it. It was the great big story. We were getting millions of people watching every day at the month. Uh, and that's how it all started. And, and so I, I went back and she she embraced me. And not only embraced me, she, she I was the only actor out of the 30 that were in that storyline that summer to survive. And so she wanted me back. But then I was asked to go to Days of Our Lives. And I don't know why, but I, I, I went there. Before and, you did, you worked with uh, Elizabeth oh, Taylor yeah, as yeah. your sister-in-law. What was that? I look at those eyes. When I sat on one, no, I, I went over to her at a table on one knee because you know she would do her scenes, then she'd leave, and there was not a lot of talk. But and she had a great sense of humor. She couldn't believe that she had to learn all those lines, and she went up so many times. Yeah. But I remember going down on one knee and going up to her and, and talking to her for fifteen minutes. But mm -hmm. I just was, you know, they're, they're the things you remember in your life that, you know, even though I went back to the table and said to the friends. Who, who, who bet that I, I, if I would go over and, and talk with her, I can't remember what I said to her or what she said to me. All I was is you look into those eyes and you think of, mm -hmm. that's a showbiz royalty. And uh, I had a chance and she gave me 15 minutes. I suppose that's a little bit of uh, fame and listen, all these years later. And she was an extraordinary, not just actress, but person. So that's how it all started. Did you stay connected uh, beyond the series with her? No, she was she was not well. She had a lot of physical problems, and um, I, I I was at a house where her secretary came and said, "You know, why don't you come over and have dinner with us one night?" And uh, he was in an accident, like a couple of weeks later, and died. And so that that connection died off, but. You know, when, when she saw it, it was during the time when the AIDS started to come out, you know, and, and she was so supportive and what all those people were going through and what, you know, actors were going through, people were afraid to kiss each other. And, right. Um, you know, that was just one of the worst times. I mean, that was celibate for four years. <laughs> I mean, you just didn't trust the, the whole situation. But listen, you know, they crossed my path. You know, when people cross your path, you know, yeah. you always look at those signposts. Yes. It's telling you have faith. You're connecting to great powers. I'm not connecting to people who are losers. Because losers, they're not going to be, they can't look at you and think they can see themselves in you. They just become envious about what you're doing because it's not happening with them. Not everybody wins, but there are solutions. And, and I find that, you know, how do you win? What, that's your goal. How do you win? And surround yourself with people who win. Did you always know this, or did life have to happen to you for you to come to this understanding? You know, some things you come in with in life. You know, you, who knows? Someone says something and it stays in your subconscious. But I remember Diane Ladd and I, I took my first metaphysics course with her, and I did it also with Shirley MacLaine. And they were tremendous. I mean, I, I really evolved times for me and I remember going to a, a private meeting with a with a, a woman from England uh, who was a, a, an analyst and a spiritual analyst and she said to me how dare you come here with the mind you have and the trash you associate with so I couldn't get over that and it took me six months but once I committed to it I started to see my life change and so whatever I was doing at that time needed to be sh to shift in order for mm -hmm. me to go into a new level either you pay attention to the messages that come in your life right a lot of people will do that for you if you're listening or yes. you just keep repeating yourself making the same mistakes over and over and not wondering and thinking you become a victim thinking oh life's not good to me look what i had to go through whatever no pay attention that something in there is a message that you need to learn to evolve as an individual. Very true. Yes, it's very true. And it may take time, but when those messages come, 
don't let them go by, seize those opportunities. And uh, yeah, I've had to do that several times too in my world. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing when you do it. It really, really is. Oh, yeah. When, yeah. when the light begins to shine on you. Yes. When you come out of a shadow that you didn't know you were in, you know, you get a, listen, if I didn't have this light, you'd see me in, in, in a shadowed area, right? You turn on the light and you see me better. So it is the same thing that happens to you as an individual. When you allow the light of life to give you the right answers that you're searching for, then you do it. Why did the podcast take five years for me to come through by the time I finished? Because now was the right time. And so that's why, you know, I've written four. Now I've got other ideas. I'm going to talk about the great love stories through the centuries. Yeah. You know, I love love stories. You know, I'm a big yes. Romeo and Juliet buff. You know, why are love stories a lot of times sad, you know, when they're okay. So we don't have enough love. We have a lot of conflict now. And I'd rather talk about the things that better us than the things that take away from us. Exactly. Right. Because there is so much negativity and toxicity out there these days. Oh, and, and I'm big about compassion and empathy and bringing the world together as opposed to everybody uh, being so divisive on every topic, uh, oh. every level. And uh, the, the world spins a lot smoother on its axis, I say all the time, when we're brought to the table, when we balance things out. We might not all get what we want, but at least we're all there sharing in the joys and blessings and beauty of life. And uh, life is just faster now and it's instant gratification and superficiality and all of this that is dominating and pushing down a lot of beautiful stuff in the world. And I know that frustrates you a lot too, doesn't it? Sam? Well, yes, you know, kindness is not an expensive thing. And, um, you know, when that friend of mine said, you know how to share your success, because during COVID, every week I had, I never got COVID, thank God, but every week I would have these four individuals over so that we wouldn't lose touch of our humanity with each other. And I would cook as best I could, uh, and we would play cards, but we would do it once a week and <clears throat> it allowed people to just go out at least once and feel safe in, the, in, in, in where they were going. And so, you know, it's, I had a lot of people in my life who were very good to me. I learned well from those gifts. And even though sometimes you took them for granted, the memories of them remain. And I feel myself blessed and very fortunate, even though sometimes, you know, uh, like my head writer one day said to me, I've had a, a great run in daytime, but and I, and I fill myself up with a lot of knowledge. But when someone comes to me and says, you're very complicated, I, I, I find it hard to write for you. When someone says that to me, I think to myself, what he's really revealing is that he's rather simple and not educated because no writer in my history in, 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 that I've ever worked with has ever said something as ignorant as that. And so, you know, it's like, what would you rather have, you know, a bowl of just chicken soup, uh, with just the broth, or would you rather have something more elaborate, give you richness? The reason why this, the Jamaras uh, were realized for so many years was because Joe and I had a big history together. You know, we started studying in the same time, same teachers. He, he was a great musician. The traveling that we did, that, that he always appreciated when I came back with stories, what we incorporated into our characters. There's John Aniston, you know, another great guy. But, you know, I can't, I, I just, we're, we're more consumed these days with youth that doesn't know much. We're consumed with things that turn us on, not the audience so much. We, our, our audience, it, the reason they've stayed faithful is because we've respected them, because we listened to them. Otherwise, you see what happens when people take advantage and don't listen. It breeds chaos. Yes, it does. And so the world is that way. Why is the world like that? Because of a greed. Mm -hmm. I can go and I'll tell you stories now, but I 
can't. But greed is is shocking to me that people can't get enough and that they won't share with others. They just want to keep it for themselves because it empowers them. That's what empowers them. What they never realize is they will trip and that one day they won't be able to get up. Very small-minded people <laughs> that do that. Yeah. yeah, They hide behind the stuff uh, as their protection. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very strange environment we're in um, yes. somebody that was you know is a phenomenal individual as well that sort of brought you over to days of our lives wasn't it gloria loring no it was pat falcon smith who was the head writer of g of general hospital gloria loring when i tested with five other actors she wanted to work with you right i called her in and they said have a look at the tapes and she chose me and that's how she it chose happened. you huh yeah. And then, of course, I have that wonderful scene where I, uh, I come back as a husband who's not particularly nice, and the next thing you know is I'm raping her, and my back goes out, and um, in, in for real. And uh, it wasn't a, an auspicious beginning, yeah. but I must say it was kind of nice to be dressed up nicely and come in. And <laughs> where I realized some of the other actors in those days didn't like me instantly because they thought, who is this swarthy person, this this ethnic person coming into our show? Because everybody was very much Anglo. And I saw those and how they tried to trip me. Mm. But eventually I won them over because, you know, as long as you can act it and you, you add to the show, that makes a difference. Exactly right. Because the Demers had their sort of ways and the Hortons had their sort of ways and, and uniquenesses into who they are and yeah. the way they were presented right yeah, right yeah uh, so um anyway i'm down to 12 percent in my battery you got the 12 oh yeah. boy <laughs> 12 i mean my my god that's that's what was it like working with dame edna with oh with my Bill, god huh? oh my god was she something uh, when i met her she was in her real outfit which was um, Barry Humphreys and Barry I remember Humphreys, being in the yeah. post office one day and his first show in New York was panned badly by uh, by the critics and he was furious and he was in the post office and I went up to him and I introduced myself and as an Australian he says did you read those effing reviews those, yeah. those, and then he says and Clive Barnes that cripple and he was really upset because he thought he was going to be a big star in New York Mm -hmm. But and then when I met him, um, I tested and got the role, but he needed to give me the approval. So, of course, he comes into the restaurant to meet me for dinner with a hat and a cape. And he looked me up and down and looked at me and he says, you'll do it. Because I had to play her love interest. <laughs> That's right. You'll do it. You'll do it. I had the most fabulous time. I was best man at his second uh, marriage. Um I went to Disneyland with him. I've cooked for him. I saw him about five years ago, the last time. But for 10 years, he and I were, were very good friends. And and then we all go our separate ways. But it was a highlight in my life because I thought he was one of the greatest comedians ever and an original. You got to go back to Australia as well for the reboot of Mission Impossible too, right? Yeah. Yes. That was that. That was the biggest one for me to go home to do that because, you know, mission is, mission's iconic, and I mean Daisy, Daisy is too. But you know, in, in many ways, there's something about going home and uh, playing the man of mystery and the masks and all that. It had such for me as an actor, it was great. And um, yeah, it was my parents. I can't tell you my father with open arms and crying. I've never seen him cry, and suddenly realized. My God, my son is not a failure. I, I can, yeah. He can go and see his Greek buddies and they can all buy him drinks. I mean, that's what he thought. He would go to the Greek club and they would say, your son, and he'd go, yes, what about him? You know, whereas before he was hiding because he had no idea what I was doing. Right. But, so, yes, Mission has a very special part. We even were in the TV miniseries Sadat back in 83. Yes, that was not easy, that show. No, huh? No, it was uh, in Mexico City. I had food poisoning. 
I was mm. playing the ace flyer for um, for um, for the Palestinians, and all I remember was the director was having a problem with the with uh, Lou Gossett, and Lou couldn't remember his lines and. He came at me and started screaming at me because he thought I'd look more like a Hollywood actor than a real military guy. So he said, get the effing hair off his face and make him look like a military flyer. And I, I was devastated. I couldn't believe it. And then he blamed me for holding up production. And I went, why would I have held the production? He went back to Columbia and they said, they believe for six months he, they had to blame somebody for the delays. And I remember one day, it was time for my close-ups. And, and I said to him, I have to leave in, in four hours to catch the plane to go back because Days, Days gave me some time off. And, and uh, he said, you can wait your turn. But what I didn't know was Columbia had sent uh, one of their guys down. And he said, uh, he said give him his close-up now or I'm going to start pulling pages out of the script. Mm. And then, so... so it wasn't until year, uh, you know, years later where a casting director said, we're so sorry that we didn't hire you because we realized he was the problem and he put the blame on you. So it wasn't, you know, instead of Lou Gossett being, taking the responsibility and saying, you know, I'm the problem. And, and he, because he couldn't speak to Lou Gossett, uh, even though Lou Gossett was nominated. Uh, I mean, he was a guy, he was a good guy, good, good actor and everything, but he was having some problems. And, uh, and, you know, I was a young guy, who, you know, knowing from days of our lives, you had to know your, your material. Exactly. And so when I went on, I had my, I knew my material, but he, yeah. he couldn't tell him to do it. So anyway, so, you know, there are times where some experiences were not good, but they were great lessons. Well, this was a good one too for you. Sydney Sheldon's Memories of Midnight, huh? That was fabulous. Yes. It was a fabulous experience. I mean, what I loved about that was that man came onto that set ready to have a fight. And he looked at me. He said, by the way, when I hit you and you go flying over that 18th century table, please do not break it. <laughs> he expressed it to me. I said, I'm not flying anywhere. He goes, what? I said, Mr. Sharif, if you punch me now, and I go flying out of that table. Where do you and I go for the rest of the four hours here? Right. <laughs> and he goes, I said, you have to have a conflict. I'm your conflict. And he put his arms out and says, I love this man. And <laughs> I love <him> to find. <laughs> and, so, a, and I love the director. And Oh, and yes. Hidden Treasures. Oh, yeah. Kelly LeBrock. Yeah. Another great film. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing yeah. when you realize all the incredible things that you've done. Santa Barbara you were on as well. Santa Barbara, people may, because they know Days and GH and the rest, but Santa Barbara as well. Do you, do you know what made that one with Kelly LeBrock? The, when we went to the Hollywood Awards, I was waiting in line with her to get in, and uh, Richard Gere came up to me. And Richard Gere said, do you remember me? 30 years ago... He was rehearsing for Hamlet that the same director was we were rehearsing with for another play. And he sat there and watched us work. And when I said, yes, I remember, yes, I remember. And, and he remembered me and remembered my name. And he was so wonderful. I thought, how many actors of his caliber would come up and say that? I don't want my battery to run out. And take, I say goodbye to you <laughs> it's it's giving you the the blinking now right <laughs> yes it's, it's down to four percent you're uh we got to mention the food and your love of food too before we yeah. tell us about uh, seducing celebrities this is so great you, you've been known for giving some phenomenal hollywood dinner parties you create such great atmosphere and great cuisine and people are left just feeling good and wanting more and you had to document it here as well, which I think is such a beautiful thing. I mean, to have an opportunity to do that and to celebrate all of these iconic people that you've had an opportunity to cook for and, and celebrate with, which is extraordinary, uh, I think is amazing. And he's such a professional. He knew to move to the other side of the house. <laughs> That's a professional, folks. Somebody else would be like, ah, He's a no, I did it because 
I thought, I'm not going to go out in a blackout. And just a fade to black. <laughs> to you. Not after all these years not on after television. All these years, you know. no. But no. but this is a wonderful celebration, uh, I think, of food and people. Tell us about this. You know, I, all the people that crossed my path, you know, that oh, I've worked so with. So many. Um, and so many, I thought, well, those, like Doris Roberts, I had cooked for many, many yes. uh, times. And she didn't live uh, far from you, right? Yeah, she she lived just over the hill because we yeah. both live in the Hollywood Hills. And uh, God, she was so dear. She, I mean, just she did the she 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 did the forward in, on, uh, in that book. And she called me and she said, "Taylor, what am I going to say?" I said, "I don't know. You come to my house for dinner all the time. Just write about how it is." Well, she wrote this whole page, and um, she said that when she used to walk in. The smell, the the atmosphere, it made her feel like you know she'd bring a bottle of Dom Perignon with her, and, yeah. and she would sit there. And of course, she'd always sit at the head of the table because she was like the dowager. Um, and also, we went, we were in the same acting class, so I, I'd known her for for a long, long time. Uh, she was a, a, a great woman and, and wonderful actress, and um, so she she did the forward on and. And all the others uh, that I uh, decided, I mean, my my manager said to me, called me up and says, oh, someone wants you to do a cookbook. I said, oh. I said, I've never written anything down. What The way I've cooked is out of my head, or I'll open the fridge and say, okay, what can I make out of this? Uh, but I said, uh, you know, I made a lot of recipes in my out of my head. So I sat there for six months going through what and how I would cook something. Then I called my sisters because they're, they're great at dessert. So I put some of their recipes in there and some of my mother's recipes and all the rest of the ones I, I made up. But listen, the, nobody ever left my ho home and called me up and said they, they were ill or they didn't feel good. Um, <laughs> You know what I mean? Yes. I don't like I like when I don't want people drinking too much when they're mm -hmm. in my house because then I'm responsible when they leave. Correct. Yeah. You know, so I've had a few problems that way with, mm. with certain people, but in, in the end, to me, food is the celebration of life. It is how we nurture our bodies. Yes, it's how we make ourselves. To me, I, I reward myself. Uh, like if I did some good work that I was excited with, I'd go and get oysters. Mm. So I would have oysters to celebrate. So I think we have to be kind to each other, or to ourselves especially. Because, you know, as we get older and you wish and you had regrets, you don't want those because you can't go back. And so for me, welcoming people to my home was to say, this is a celebration of our lives. This is something that we deserve. I, I never, I was never cheap. I remember somebody brought some <laughs> two buck chuck, you know, that wine that's two ninety nine, and they brought them and they had the audacity to go into the kitchen. So they spent what, $6 and, and they brought it to the table and opened the bottles and put them on the table, which made it look like, I had they, they were from you. <laughs> they were brought from me, and I and I cheapened the dinner. Yeah. I looked and I remember, and I said, "Please get that cheap wine off my table." And they were like, "What?" To get the cheap wine off my table, and um, someone brought recently two buck chuck, and I told them right off, right in there. I said, "You know, it would have been better if you didn't bring anything, because if that's what you think in your celebration, and the reason why." you are struggling in life is because you look at life and yourself in a cheap way. Mm. Celebrate well, you know, it doesn't always come back again, but that's true. You know, so it that's is. why that book means something. And, um, and I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed doing it. I mean, I could do another one actually. Have you um, thought of it doing another? Yeah, but we'll, we'll see right now I'm doing the podcast and, which is uh, I've got other stories to tell. Um, but all I know is every time I think about going home, yeah, something happens and I say, it's not over. It's not over. Well, you know, you were killed off days of our lives, what, seven times, I think, if I counted or so. Uh, so as far as going anywhere, <laughs> you are the comeback kid. <laughs> 
and well, audiences want you have always wanted you back. They want your character. They love you. I would never allow it again. I would never allow Some tough ways that again. you've exited too. Yeah, <laughs> it's a real I tough. I just way. feel like I'd rather walk up the stairs and disappear that way. But if there was a script that came to me now at this stage of my life and they wanted to kill me off again, I would walk. Yeah, yeah. It just, it's enough. It's enough. You know, yeah, it makes it harder for the actor to come back and have to justify why he's back after they right. back. And also the audience doesn't like it. They mourned you. And then you're saying, oh, well, it was and fake. They, you know, it was a lie. Yeah. And yeah. seven times is a bit hard to take. Right. That that time with the Salem Strangler, too, where uh, just about everybody was being killed off. And then uh, yeah. all of a sudden, most are still there. <laughs> or the dream sequence. Or uh, didn't you have one where you fell off a ladder or stairs and you ended up on a beam that had a spike or something? Or uh, yes, that, that, When I saw that, I really yeah. resented that because it reminded me of Dracula. And so I thought, what is it with this writer, you know? And then, you know, you find out that a couple of actors had went and said that I thought his scripts were terrible and that's not what I, I never said. I said, one of those, I'm one of those few actors that actually learn what's on the page. I don't change dialogue. Right. Firstly, it takes enough time to learn it. It does, right? Yeah, some yeah. people it's immediate, but you like to take time and prepare. Yeah, I like to break it do. down. Yeah, I right. like to break it down. You know, the only thing you have is your reputation. And if you want people to trust you and people to believe in you, then you've got to be able to say, this is who I am and this is what I stand for. Otherwise, you're going to be like we're doing with politicians today. Who trusts anybody anymore? You know, because there have been so many lies and misconceptions and it puts people in, you know, people don't deserve that. People have enough struggles in their lives to survive without having been lied to them. And, you know, I'm so tired. I mean, it's not just in this country. It's all over the world. I mean, you know, people who want to be dictators, you know, they get there to lie. And, you know, what happens with dictators? And they always end up in the wrong place. And they take people with them. So for me is, you know, tell the truth. You tell that once. You know, if you lie, you've got to keep changing your story. Yes. So there's a beauty in telling those truths. The truths. Yeah. You you have one, as I said, you yeah. are, who are you? Right. And how do you live with yourself? Exactly. You know, do you have a conscience? You know, so. Have yeah. you thought of doing motivational speaking and things of that nature? Because you do have that within you and it flows out beautifully and eloquently and, and, and in an impactful way. Yeah. Have you thought of adding that to? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, I've gone to actors' classes and talked to them and, and inspired them. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I have... I can do it through other things. I, I like, there's something about writing that in the end, uh, when you're an actor or a, or a storyteller, when you write, you give muscle to your dialogue. You, something, there's something about writing a word that it's like exercising. Mm. It's exercising the dialogue. And when right. you do that, there's more, there's, you are, we take the dialogue for granted, words for granted. We just learn them, or we do a wrote and or we lie about something. But when you write, it's another addition to the persona of who you are, so that there's gravitas to to the words that you're expressing between you and your audience or your host. Um, no, it's very important. How do you become? How do you become? Because like as you know, as Obama's as she, uh, Mrs. Obama, uh, she she said be, uh, becoming, and oh, I always remember Michelle the word. Obama, yeah. yeah, and I go, oh, isn't that interesting? Life is about becoming. Well, I'm at that stage where I've become, and 
you know, I, I know what I'm standing on. And, and I know the people who are in my life now are people I trust. And uh, the ones I don't, um, I'm gone. And it's yes. not always easy, but, you know. Right. I, I, I want, did you do it well? Did you live it well? You know, when you leave, what did you represent? You know? Yes. And that, that, that I, I find integrity is very important. The great ones in life tell the truth. Hmm. The you know? yeah. and the liars are the ones who get away for, uh, for a while because it's their ego that is inflated. But that's the thing because it's empty. Yeah. That's the thing that dilutes itself over time and you become empty because there was nothing there in the first place. So working in an industry like Hollywood, like film, television, entertainment, where a lot of things are created or, uh, you know, there's fiction. And, and like you said, you came to America because the films were beautiful and the sets and the streets and the scenery. And with the television shows, all the problems were solved in 22 minutes or less. Now, having been in it, in, for decades in various ways, shapes, and forms, meeting so many people, being exposed to so much of life in many different ways, it seems like you're in a sweet spot where you are you. Are you. you. You are doing the things you want to do that speak to your heart and your soul, and you're sharing them with the world through the writings, the books, the podcast. You are not you playing the part of, the role of, or fitting in the box or doing this. You are you and expressing you now. And it's a beautiful time in your life. Some people had to go away. Some things had to be disconnected. But you are able through having survived and thrived in an extraordinarily difficult industry, uh, you have risen to a point where there's this inner peace and satisfaction and understanding of the humanity of life, which you've always understood, but now you're able to express it in ways that really connect people because it's coming directly from Teo. That's what yeah, I feel and observe from the conversation. Yes. That's the whole idea of becoming, you know, it's a, it's a lifetime journey and it is all about, not being fearful of going into the unknown. And so that when you do cross those paths and you've done it and survived it, you then are willing, because you've strengthened yourself within, you're then able to go to another new life. Part of, that is part of, you know, as my teacher Milton used to say, you know, life and acting is like a, a necklace. You know, each time you go through certain things that are, life changing, you add another bead. And in the end, really, it's a complete necklace. And, um, you know, I, you, know, you, you say, how many years do you have left and, uh, to do? I just, um, it's about being with around people who resonate, you know. I think Oprah said it too. There are people who are not gonna want your success. There are gonna people around you who don't see themselves in you because you don't reflect that and they would rather bring it down or try to change it in some way or, you know, how do people, you know, you, you've given of yourself and then, you know, the next day they stab you in the back, you know, it's, it's like now I'm finding, you know, um, with our show wanting it to survive because we've been part of, of its history and given people so many years of enjoyment because you know, a lot of women stayed home because they want to raise their families and even the husbands um, got caught up in the show. Uh, you know, we had a responsibility. And for those of us and what we're going through now, I just think, wow, you, you took the cream mm. away from the top. Yeah. And um, so, you know, the thing is always to be ahead of the game. If you see things are going to be changing yeah. in your life and it's up to you to have some plan, not just saying, oh, well, I'll just wait for life to show me where to go. Uh, that's what the podcast has done for me. It's given me another level that I did not 
no, I had. And why better in, in, in telling about stories that, that the reason why they've lasted is because people did it well. People gave us history that is amazing. And, and the fact that we teach it at schools, we take the youth, we inspire them, we give them adventures, we tell them about heroes, what is a hero? You know, these stories remain. And then when you get a chance to talk about it, uh, you're on, you're you're on there. You're in that energy field of of those who came before you. Yes. And that's why these stories, you know, my first one being about finding the gold of Troy, and the second one is the curse that comes through finding the treasures, which was a horrible curse. The third one, I had the pleasure of going to to Kefalonia and meet with a scholar and. Um, explorer in finding the true story of where Ulysses is and uh, was and went in, in his footsteps and climbed mountains and and, and uh, sat with scholars and, and I came back and I went wow I, I've been able to be part of the Ulysses story it's, my idea was let's bring him home after 3,000 years because we have found that he his, his island was somewhere else. It's not what they think today. And these great scholars from England who found this information and, and, and the, 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 the diving into the ocean where Ulysses came home and imagining in my mind, watching him come home and climb those mountains to the pig farm so he could come home to his wife after 10 years at war and 10 years of being lost at sea. So these were incredible stories. And they, they, they're, they're classics. And so, you know, that's, you know, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey are really the, the great literature that came out of ancient Greece and uh, mm. by, by men who were illiterate yeah. and who told stories with an instrument. And so this is what these stories are about. And I find them so adventuresome. And then the fourth about what some of these journeys did, you know, even when Hezbollah, I was exploring Alexander the Great in in, in um, Lebanon, and the way they pulled me out of the car and threw me against the wall, thinking I was I was a, an Israeli spy. You know, how do you get out of that? You know, so it's all those things that you know you don't you don't test life that way and say you're going into dangerous territory. Even though sometimes my family would go crazy when I was going to the Middle East because of all its problems, but I always felt that I was. Um, you know, when your ethics are in, you'll be in some way, you'll be shown the way out. What would the Teo of today say to that young, ambitious child that <laughs> had, you know, the 10 year old, the 20 year old Teo? What would you say to him today? from all of your rich and incredible and continuing experiences of, of life, Teo? You know, when I was 20 and I met with this psychic who predicted that in my 30s I would become a villain that would be very popular in television, when I went to family members and told them the story, they all laughed. They thought I was... Here he goes again with his fantasies and whatever. Um, that seed that was planted then came true. And all I could say to my young self is that what a, an adventure you have coming. If you stay true to your identity and who you really are in life, even though there are going to be a lot of obstacles, enjoy the obstacles go through them and see what kind of a light shines on you from the other side by having gone through them. So I would say you are very blessed and very fortunate that life has given you these treasures. You know, it's amazing because of the name, the lost treasures, how you, you talk about the treasures of life. It's so perfectly named. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing, too, is that we're living in such a fast-paced world. People don't take time to, to, to look at the beautiful cultures, appreciate them, the historical places, all of these incredible ancestral connections 
and even about other cultures and ancestral connections. Um, does that frustrate you that we're living in such a fast paced instant gratification world where history is not necessarily always talked about? People don't have time for it. It's always about next. It's about what I'm going to do next. And people are just looking for maybe quick hits, like we mentioned earlier, abbreviated superficial ways to get through their day, scrolling and social media and all this craziness. When there's all this other, there's dinner parties at Teo's, there's, there's fabulous places to visit, there's life to be lived. And while some of those other things have a purpose here and there, to not make life just all about the scrolling and about the frenetic pace and the anger. I, I've talked about that a lot on air, off air, in my various ways, shapes, and forms. And it sort of disappoints, frustrates me too, because I'm my father has always said, Jim, born 30 years too late, old soul, the way you think about things. Even with this, we don't even call these interviews, we call them conversations, because I love to I love to do things that create a feeling and leave people with a feeling. And I find that that's something that is very important for you and always has been is the depth of feeling that is associated with everything you do and everything you touch to the best of your ability. Um, well, that's very profound, really, what you just said. I think, um, I don't think people realize until it's over what they've lived through. They don't, you can't see it while you're in it. Experience will allow you to get a sense of it, but it's, it's not until it's over that you realize um, what you've resonated with, the shallowness of things, because that's not going to last. Um, I think it's very important that, you know, the parents, you know, I see parents when you go to restaurants and the children are sitting around and they're all on their phones. And I, it's none of my business, but I think to myself, you know, what are you, what are you contributing? What are you contributing there? Because that's not going to sustain. You can't remember. We can't even remember who won the Oscar yesterday. You know, what, what are the important things, the values, the values and the way we treat each other? Um, when you're happy with yourself, you know, that's what happens of a, a soul well lived, a soul well lived, is that you have come into this life to work on who you are. And that only unravels itself slowly. And then in the end, towards the end, in the last renaissance, people start to realize and are miserable and upset and angry that they didn't sustain, they didn't have enough money for, or they didn't think ahead or treat people well and find themselves on their own. Because that's what happens later, because everybody goes. And those who remain, I mean, I'm in the front line now. I mean, all my relatives are gone, but I have my brother and my sisters and my cousins. But I noticed when I went back home, they, a lot of them were miserable. They were not happy people, and that is, they went by the rules or what people thought they should be, how they should behave. They didn't, they didn't know how to inspire themselves to become what they are meant to do. So what they've done is delayed in the next life, I think, of things that they have to come back and repeat. But this time will be even more difficult. So I, uh, I think while you're in it, do it as well as you can. And, and consider others. It's not just about you. And that bloody phone that happens with people. I mean, yes. you know, yesterday a woman came crashing into me when I'm walking in the street because she was on her phone. And I lost it. She got really upset and nervous. And, and, and I, I think she, she, goes, she saw Count, Count Tony DeMera reappearing for the eighth time. I have a friend, <laughs> I have a friend, <laughs> I have a friend who, who's in the industry. She says, oh, did you? Did you give them the Andre de Mera attitude? I was say, you um, don't you don't bump into a de Mera like that. <laughs> no, it's no, no, and and you know, pay attention. That woman was not paying attention. She was not in the present. You know, that's the only time change is going to happen. People are either thinking, oh, the past and what happened, and then they'll think, oh, what's going to happen in the future? 
to be in the present means that you have to be able to be satisfied that there's nothing on the table right now. Mm. And what you're having to look at is, who are you? Right. People say, oh, I don't want to do that. That's boring. You know, that's all boring. No, it's not. Get to your 60s and your 70s and your 80s, because I've seen it all in front of me. And those who have left most of the time have not been happy. I've never met too many people who said, I can go now because I have done what I meant to do. No. Now, people are, uh, uh, are unhappy and angry. You see that all the time. You're not doing your homework. When people get angry, I think, what's, what's your problem? You're not doing your homework. Why do you get angry at other people when it's your responsibility that you have not, not taken that and looked at it and said, you know, this, how do I heal that? How do I take care of that? How do I become kind to somebody? How do I share my sandwich with somebody who's starving? It's all those things that are about life. Life is a, an incredible thing that we've been given. We have so much to, to, that's out there, but you have to work. You have to earn it. Yes. And if you're privileged, you know, like some people are, uh, and that's life, yeah. uh, they're never too happy because it's, it's always about them and it's shallow, you know, so. Absolutely right. And they're calling again from Greece to confirm and Australia. Well, they're they're me. Great. When are you going to shut up? <laughs> great lessons, my friend. Really, yeah. truly great lessons. What are, before we wrap, some of those continued blessings and joys in your life that propel you to continue doing what you do so well, inspiring and entertaining all of us? There. Food. Yeah, that's a good one. And we have a foodie audience. <laughs> yeah, uh, food because it nourishes me. Yeah. It nourishes my mind and my spirit. It shows that I'm being kind to myself. I mean, every night for me is a dinner if I stay home and cook. I mean, it's not something that I do, you know, let's make a sandwich or let's just have a salad. I, I mean, it's an event. Um, I don't know. You know, when I lost my parents, I had lost them in the same week which was a very hard thing to get over. And then I came back to days, and then they killed my character off. So I had a whopping year. That was the big awakening. That was in 1995. And I thought to myself, I will never allow myself to go through something like this again with the way I was treated. And um, so I thought it first starts with self. And so nourish yourself and, and take from what your parents gave you and make it worth something. Because in many ways, I still feel they're here. And, um, you know, I had great, great family. And even though my father was a little bit of a monster, I, 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 I let him realize that he was worth something because I was able to give back to him that he couldn't give to me. And so... Um, Forgiveness is such an important thing, isn't oh, it? Yeah, that's why people get sick, you know. It's, yeah. it's being at dis-ease with, with, yes. with yourself and the environment. And dis-ease, exactly. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. So, you're you're anyway. amazing. You're, I appreciate your being so open and authentic. I think you've inspired a lot of people with our conversation in talking about your epic career and days of our lives and all the other wonderful things you've been a part of, but also maybe understanding the person behind all the characters, the person behind all of the years and decades of entertainment and what you know really makes you tick and what's in your heart and soul and one of them, of course, is the Lost Treasures. Congratulations on that. Um, as far as people getting a chance to follow along and, and find it, um, what's the best way? And is this something that's ongoing or was it just a couple of episodes? No, this is four episodes. They all run except for one. Um, they're all around 35 minutes each. Um, so it's the beginnings of it. Um, it it's, it'll premiere on Spotify and Amazon and Apple and congratulations. Yeah, and all the um, and all the major uh, streaming platforms. And yeah, yeah, and it's something new to me because you know I'm not savvy when it comes to technical things. I mean, I still have a friend of mine that comes and shows me how to do things. I mean, I I can get along with a lot of stuff, but um, no, it's. Uh, it's a continuation. 
Uh, can I predict what's going to happen? No. All I know is it took me a long time to write these stories. They came from my journeys. They came from my uh, research, you know, going through 60,000 documents in the Gennadius Library in Athens to understand Schliemann's story. Um, put that into words and emotions, and it's kind of wonderful. You don't have to worry about how you look or anything. You just go into the studio. You 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 start to read your language that you wrote because of the way you've lived. And because I'm an actor, I was able to give it different levels uh, and bring in when I had to talk about somebody else in the story or, you know, how, how do you create an awakening of some sorts? And so each one of them has its own substance. I love the fact that I met the scholar uh, who just sent me a note saying that he just heard the three podcasts and and the one I wrote on him and Ulysses, and he was absolutely thrilled. He said, I listened to them twice um, because he called the third one poetic, he said, mm -hmm. John Crawshaw. Um, and he said, and how you performed it. So, you know, to perform your own material, that's a first, you know. I performed all through my life somebody else's language, and this is mine. And so it came from my core, and that's what makes it different. From any other experience I've had, and I'm and, and I'm I'm glad I did it because yeah, in many ways I think people will will enjoy you know and to listen to them because they are uh, they are a soundtrack of, of stories that have changed the world from great uh, historians and, and great explorers and mm -hmm. you know so um, and they're deep I suppose they're not you know. They're not shallow. It's not talking about, even though you know, it's a fair. People will talk about fairy tales and you know all those kinds yeah. of story. But yeah. no, it's it's something uh, that I it came the idea and and I and I had the perseverance to trust to it. it. A lot of the a lot of the times things will come and you don't even think anything's going to come of it. You got to trust it. And if you're creating something new in your life, the uh, the process that you go through is enjoy it yes as you come through because you don't come back to it right you enjoy it and 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 you you're you're telling people that i'm giving you things i've been blessed with and i'm sharing them with you and that's what these stories to me are about and that's why i want to do the love stories and i want to do about the french kings i mean i have a lot of things that i want to talk about yeah you know that, are, that have mysteries and and treasures in life are not always about gold and diamonds treasures are also about the soul because the journey of life really like ithaca the poem ithaca talks about the journey of life is is really the journey of the heart yes and that's what this is this is this is telling the story of my heart in a sense exactly right that's yeah. what i was saying earlier you've come to this sweet spot where now it's you doing you celebrating and sharing you uh you've played other roles you've read words others have written you've done what you've had to do and have enjoyed it and have mastered it and have inspired others along the way entertained others and um been mentored by people you mentor mm -hmm. in your own way and now this is your love of adventure, love of history coming together. And we encourage folks to definitely check out the lost yeah. treasures. Um, speaking well, of treasures, this conversation truly was a treasure, my friend. Absolutely. I really appreciate your being so real, so authentic, so affable, so approachable uh, with your wit and wisdom. And, and I hope you enjoyed the time with me as much oh, as I yeah. have with you, Teo. Mr. Masters, you know, I have to say this to you. You never know what you're going to talk about, really. You have an idea, but what comes out um, through you, I always say that to people. Know the difference when it comes through you rather than from you. Because when it comes from you, it's your ego, and that's going to trip. But if it comes through you, it means you're connected to a higher source. And that's why when people interrupt you in a conversation, it's because they weren't listening. It's so important to know the difference. And that was pointed out to me. It was a great lesson. So 
um, I think the reason why we resonated is because our conversation was coming through us rather That's than right. from us. That's right. But thank, thank you. Thank you for the experience. It was great. I appreciate that. And as my father has always said and told us when we were seven years old, uh, whenever anybody says something kind or nice to you, Jim, ask them to please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> <laughs> So true, huh? <laughs> Tell you, you're a blessing, truly. You. And uh, our, our viewers have been commenting uh, throughout with all kinds of beautiful words. And we appreciate everybody uh, commenting thoroughly throughout. Um, we'll keep the porch light on for you. You're welcome back anytime, my friend. And continue blessings and joy and good health. And uh, good luck as well with the lost treasures. We'll be following along. Thank you. Thank you for being such a good host. I appreciate that. You be well, my friend. And before you go, everybody wants to know, what are you going to have for dinner now? You made us hungry. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. I'll have to have the fridge and think, mm, what do I do with this? Um, it won't be a sandwich, folks. <laughs> no, it won't be a sandwich. I love Cornish hens. I love to make Cornish hens. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's a little too early for thinking about dinner. I usually do that around 5 o'clock. So anyway, and to all those who came, thank you very much for joining us today. Absolutely. So yeah. you be well. And thanks for all the years of incredible entertainment and inspiration. And we'll we'll chat again down the line, okay? Best yeah. of luck with thank everything. You. Thank you, Jim. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye now. Incredible conversation with an incredible gentleman, truly somebody who has made a difference for years, not only as an actor on television and film and and stage and all, but through all these other projects and other ideas and thoughts that he shares with all of us through his various platforms and ways of reaching out to people through his writings. Now the podcast as well, which is The Lost Treasures, going to be available on all of the platforms, Spotify and Apple iTunes and all the places where you can find, you know, the podcasts. So that's really cool. And again, as I mentioned early in the beginning of our conversation, not only is he a wonderful actor and he has a unique spirit and a unique understanding of humanity, which I resonated with. And those of you who watch our show regularly know that I'm big on that and I enjoy the human connection. And we don't even call these interviews. We really call these conversations. Uh, he's been traveling and he's been exploring and he's been sharing truly all his life as he's been doing Santa Barbara, General Hospital, Mission Impossible, Days of Our Lives, all of these series and shows and films and all. He has been exploring the world and now he's talking about it and documenting it. And what great stories of Jacqueline Kennedy or Nassus and Claudette Colbert and giving some wardrobe advice to Robert Redford. Incredible. And of course, working with Roland and what that was like working with uh, the iconic Liz Taylor. Yes. I mean, that's just a short list of some of the amazing people he's worked with, working with, of course, everybody, Peter Graves and all on the reboot of Mission Impossible, where it was filmed in his homeland of Australia, where I think he once had said if he was to retire, that's where he would retire back home, his years on General Hospital, of course, as well, and his many years on Days of Our Lives. I mean, we're talking like some 60 years this series has existed on NBC, which is absolutely unbelievable. I know many of you love the soap operas, love the series. We all grew up with Days of Our Lives and Another World and Somerset and Edge of Night and Love is a Many Splendored Thing and God, you can General Hospital, One Life to Live, Ryan's Hope, <laughs> Young and the Restless, The Bold and the Beautiful. Sure. We worked. We watched all of those. And uh, this was when Days of Our Lives celebrated 56 years. And Taylor was right in there as well. Some other wonderful shots too. Yep. With Gloria Loring. And of course, you know, the plot line on Days of Our Lives with Anna and Tony. Everybody remembers that. Of course, with Deidre Hall. And the longevity as well. 
is extraordinary. Look at that. With Drake and Deirdre. We got into such a good conversation about life. I wanted to make sure that, um, and I thought it was extraordinary. You, you uh, reveled in some of these great photos as well. There's Andre. Of course. There we go there. John Aniston, too. He had a wonderful friendship with John Aniston, Jennifer Aniston's dad, who, of course, was uh, on the show as well. And, of course, Joe played Stephanos. Yeah. Here's some other great shots. Look at that. More great shots of our very special guest here on the show. Funny stories working with uh, Barry Humphreys, who played Dame Edna, who we just lost not that long ago. There he is. There's Taylor with his mom. We wanted to show that. And of course, with his folks. And it was really wonderful that he was able to reconcile with his dad. And just all of the great conversation that we had here on the show. And this really, you know, is just scratching the surface of an extraordinary career. We, we know, you know, if you follow along with his career, with Taylor's career, he's done so much and continues to, not just with Days of Our Lives or General Hospital, and of course, when he was with Santa Barbara or Mission Impossible or, or any of these incredible epic productions, it's just really a wonderful conversation. So The Lost Treasures is the name of the podcast. It's going to be really, really something spectacular. A lot of history. And uh, if you're a history buff, you're going to love it. Art and culture. And we're big on that as well. We thank Taylor for stopping by the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. Gang, if this was your first time watching our series, I encourage you to go back in our archives on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. If you liked this episode, give it a like. We would love that. And all you have to do is click this button. It is the like button on all the episodes. It's on the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. Click like, drop a comment on the channel if you enjoyed this episode and all the episodes you enjoy. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. That helps us grow and celebrate more great guests Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guests we've celebrated for you here, including Teo today on the Gym Master Show Live series. Uh, we've done almost a thousand episodes, so you can go back in the archives and you can binge watch to your heart's content. All of the great guests, celebrity friends from Hollywood and Broadway, television, film, music, stage, culinary arts, sports, comedy, inspiration, life in general. Some of them are incredibly famous people and some of them are noted and uh, some are just starting their careers out. We welcome everybody here at the Gym Master Show Live series. Uh, for those of you watching for the first time, we're here in the United States. We know we have a lot of international viewers who watch and there's a lot of folks watching right now from all around the world. Our uh, home base is here on the East Coast of the United States in the New York area. Yes, we are here in the New York area, and uh, that's where I'm from originally. And uh, we are here along the beautiful coast between New York and Boston. And that's where uh, this show generates. And uh, our audience calls themselves the Gym Master Show Lovities, because in the early days of our series, I said that the Gym Master Show Live um, has a lot of light, love, and levity. And one time I said light, and then I said, lovity. And when I said, lovity, everybody jumped on the word and they're like, lovity. We love that word. You're now Mr. Lovity. This is Lovity Hall. We're your Lovity squad. And the guests are part of the Lovity family. I mentioned that to Teo before we went live. You know, we have a nice conversation with the guests, usually about 20 to 15 minutes before the show goes live. We'll check the audio. We'll check the video. Make sure their signal is strong. Our signal is strong. We'll, we won't talk about too much about what we're going to talk about on the show because we want it to be fresh and conversational, not scripted, no questions pre-prepared. He didn't send questions. His team didn't send questions. I didn't prepare questions because I, you know, we do the research all beforehand, but of course I've always admired his career and all these guests we've had come on, uh, we've admired. And you know what happens too? Oftentimes guests, enjoy so much the atmosphere we've created. They want to come back. 
We've had guests who've been on our show two, three, four times, um, which I think is a beautiful thing. And uh, they spread the word. They tell other folks after they've experienced our show, they're like, I really like that show. It's different. Uh, it's unique. It's conversations, not just interviews. I want to, I'm going to tell all my friends uh, that are in the industries to come on the show as well. So uh, I work professionally in television and radio on the air as a on air host and television journalist, And uh, I've also done voiceover work and I'm a narrator. Uh, I've done radio programs. I've hosted all kinds of television shows you can think of here in America, radio shows, digital content creator, um, I've done modeling. What else? It sounds like I'm auditioning here. <laughs> Motivational speaking. Uh, I've emceed lots of concerts. I've been on PBS for years um, and other networks and shows and stations. Writing, producing, hosting, on air, on camera. I've done sports. I've done weather. I've done news. I've done game shows and shopping shows and a lot. And I love it all. And, and Teo, same thing. He's done so many different things. And during that time, he's been, you know, exploring and digging deep in history and art and culture. And I think that's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. If you enjoyed this show, this episode, don't keep it a secret. Tell other folks, get on top of the highest mountain in your hometown with a bullhorn and say, I'm a love on the gym master show. I love it. Uh, Andrea says, uh, Boston's in the house. Good to see you up there in Bean Town. We love it. Sherry Larson says, thank you, Jim, for an absolutely amazing conversation. Totally enjoyed. Thank you for all you do. Sherry, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And everybody who's been commenting, uh, new folks, a lot of new folks watching. Uh, we appreciate that. We welcome you as well. Kathleen Walker in New York City. Wonderful show, Jim. Thank you. Teo was such a terrific guest. Such a nice guy. Really nice to see. Tell management, you are the best. <laughs> Thank you very much. And she did a super chat. Thank and the beautiful green, the Irish green that I love. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Really, from my heart to yours, I appreciate that. Very, very kind to uh, support our show and our series. You can do that in the uh, Lovely Hall chat room when the shows are live. Super chat, super emoji, super stickers, or anytime. Super thanks when the show uh, is not on, or even when the show is on. There's a super thanks heart icon on all the episodes on the YouTube channel. And you can. Uh, support our shows that way as well. Yes, I already told Teo, he is a lovety, a Gym Master Show lovety. You enjoyed, uh, thanks Jane and Kathleen, great photos. You enjoyed the photos as well. Yeah, we, we researched and we we dug and um, yeah, it was kind of cool. We wanted to know what uh, Teo was going to have. He made us hungry, right? He loves food. He absolutely loves food and he shares it with uh, with those. Uh, we want to say hello to everybody also watching in uh, Teo's uh, native land of Australia. All our beautiful friends watching in Australia and New Zealand, we welcome you. We realize that it's uh, you know probably a wacky time of the day right now in Australia. I think it's early in the morning, right? Um, so we welcome everybody who's watching this live or will be watching this later on in Australia and all watching across, again, North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia. And um, yeah, we appreciate that. Uh, Stacy says, this interview has been truly amazing. Loved every minute of it. Thanks, uh, TP, for being super amazing as always. And Jim, I'll be watching more of your shows. Thank you very much. Stacy, nice to have you with us now as a JMS Lovity here on the Gym Master Show Life Series. And we welcome you. And uh, Jane is here too. And she's Jane Shaiwan. I like that. Enjoyed you as always, darling, Teo. So many things to learn, so many places to visit, so much generosity and that heart and wisdom. Thank you for sharing your gifts. And thank you for joining us. Spread the word if you enjoyed it. Uh, Jane, give it a thumbs up and a like and, and everything else. And, uh, and Jane, yes, there's several Janes that watch our show. <laughs> Thank you, Taylor, for being here tonight. It was uh, very interesting. You're very wise and giving so much good advice. Thank you, Jim. Pleasure is all mine as well. I'll take a look at a couple of comments here from our viewers. As we mentioned, you're, I'm a very interactive host, so you're welcome to comment and say hello. Many of you have had some wonderful comments uh, throughout, and we really, really appreciate all these beautiful words. Uh, Mary Ann said, love it. 
a great job. Love the stories. That is fantastic. Absolutely. Very interesting. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. So kind of you to say that. And Kathleen was saying uh, thank you for being here today. Oh, pleasure meeting you and listening to you. Thank you for sharing your life with us. Welcome to our Levity family. Yeah, this is great. I love this. You guys are terrific. That was smooth, not even out of breath. Yeah, you get two good conversationalists together, Andrea, and uh, and that's what happens. Didn't you love the smooth? He had told me when before we started that his computer was at 83% and that he might have to move to another location in his house and plug in. And I said, if you have to do that, no worries. Other guests sometimes, you know, they, they started the conversation when their computer or their phone is only at 20% and they have to plug in and perfectly fine. It was very smooth. We, we put the full screen up of the, uh, the, the book of his, <laughs> and that was terrific. And, um, so gang, all of this, you guys are terrific. Marianne says, uh, great conversation and so enlightening. That's great. I appreciate that. And, um, I'm enjoying this conversation so much. I could listen to you two gentlemen all day. Thank you very much. Kathleen, wonderful words. Thank you, Teo. Love them both. We love you back. Pam watching in Maryland, USA. Thank you for your kind words as well and, and everybody watching. So good stuff. This was terrific. Um, we thank you for being with us. This is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time and uh, stick with us. We've got so many great guests coming up. Don't forget, give this episode a like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. You can see this episode again on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV, in its entirety. If you came in late or you missed anything, you can see it again on our YouTube channel. And uh, you can share the episode uh, you know, let folks know that, uh, you know, you can share the link and then when they click the link, it'll bring them back to our YouTube channel, which is great because that helps when you share the episode links from our YouTube channel on your social media, that helps our channel grow. And that also helps uh, us reach many, many more people around the world when you do that. Also, when you like and you comment, it actually boosts the visibility of these fabulous episodes with all these great guests and all these amazing conversations. All right, time for dinner here because we're on the East Coast of the United States and it's like after six o'clock. And I, you know what I've had today? It's been such a busy day because I was on the radio all day today. And then we've got some major television shoots that are coming up and flying off to Phoenix, Arizona soon. And then San Francisco, California, um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, Washington, DC and Baltimore, Maryland. For television work, I just had two pieces of toast and a cup of coffee, and it's six o'clock at night. It's all I had all day today. I, I shouldn't tell Teo, <laughs> but maybe he'll cook for me. Um, God, could you imagine the food that he comes up with? Oh boy, I love good gourmet food too. So, uh, we're gonna have something a little bit more than toast about now. And uh, again, thank you. You're all treasures as well. All of you, all of you who watch and support what we're doing here at JMS, it means a lot to me. And we, we appreciate all of the time and the attention. All right. We're going to scoot off. Thanks for being with us, gang. We love you all. And um, this was a terrific episode. And we thank our very special guest for joining us uh, from Los Angeles, California. He really was uh, absolutely amazing right here on the Jim Master Show Live. See you on the next one, gang. Thanks for being with us, watching all around the world. You mean the world to us. I am your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time. I'll be right here in this host chair waiting for you on the next episode of the Jim Masters Show Live. Take care and be well, gang. We love you all. And cheers. <laughs>